everybody. Just wait a little bit. Keep that back. And tonight we are almost finished. We have one more night tomorrow. And we are reading The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum, illustrated by W. W. Denslow. And tonight we're reading chapters 20 and 21. They're pretty short, so it'll be a quick one. So I just want to wait a little bit just to make sure that everybody gets in if they want to watch right now. And I will just quickly summarize that Dorothy and the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion all made it to the Emerald City. And the wizard wanted them to kill the Wicked Witch of the West. And poor Dorothy ended up doing it by killing her with a bucket of water and melted her. So they made it back and found out that Oz was a humbug. He was false. He was not actually a wizard. He was just a regular old human man from Omaha. So he was able to give symbolic promises to each of them, except for Dorothy, who wanted to go back to Kansas. And he made up a hot air balloon last night when we read the previous chapters. And unfortunately, Dorothy did not make it on that hot air balloon, but she seems to be okay with that. And everybody in Emerald City says the best way to grant her wish to go back to Kansas is to go see Glinda, the Good Witch of the South. So we'll see what happens in this as they journeyed south and they made it through the forest with the trees that attacked them. And now they have made it to a giant wall and the Tin Woodman was just making a ladder to climb up. So let's see what happens on the journey to the south. All right. I think we'll get started. So this is chapter 20, The Dainty China Country. So there's Dorothy, and we'll see who these folks are when we start. While the woodman was making a ladder from wood, which he found in the forest, Dorothy lay down and slept, for she was tired by the long walk. The lion also curled himself up to sleep, and Toto lay beside him. The scarecrow watched the woodman while he worked and said to him, I cannot think why this wall is here, nor what it is made of. Rest your brains and do not worry about the wall, replied the woodman. When we have climbed over it, we shall know what is on the other side. After a time, the ladder was finished. It looked clumsy, but the tin woodman was sure it was strong and would answer their purpose. The scarecrow waked Dorothy and the lion and Toto and told them that the ladder was ready. The scarecrow climbed up the ladder first, but he was so awkward that Dorothy had to follow close behind and keep him from falling off. When he got his head over the top of the wall, the scarecrow said, Oh my! Go on! exclaimed Dorothy. So the scarecrow climbed further up and sat down on the top of the wall, and Dorothy put her head over and cried, Oh my! just as the scarecrow had done. Then Toto came up and immediately began to bark but Dorothy made him be still. The lion climbed the ladder next, and the tin woodman came last, but both of them cried, Oh my, as soon as they looked over the wall. When they were all sitting in a row on the top of the wall, they looked down and saw a strange sight. Before them was a great stretch of country, having a floor as smooth and shining and white as the bottom of a big platter. Scattered around were many houses made entirely of china and painted in the brightest colors. These houses were quite small, the biggest of them reaching only as high as Dorothy's waist. That's about up to here, probably. There were also pretty little barns with china fences around them and many cows and sheep and horses and pigs and chickens all made of china were standing about in groups. 
but the strangest of all were the people who lived in this queer country. There were milkmaids and shepherdesses with bright colored bodices and golden spots all over their gowns, and princesses with most gorgeous frocks of silver and gold and purple, and shepherds dressed in knee breeches with pink and yellow and blue stripes down them, and golden buckles on their shoes, and princes with jeweled crowns upon their heads, wearing ermine robes and satin doublets, and funny clowns and ruffled gowns with round red spots upon their cheek, and tall pointed caps. And strangest of all, these people were all made of china, even to their clothes, and were so small that the tallest of them was no higher than Dorothy's knee. No one did so much as look at the travelers at first, except one little purple china dog with an extra large head, which came to the wall and barked at them in a tiny voice, afterwards running away again. How shall we get down? asked Dorothy. They found the ladder so heavy they could not pull it up, so the scarecrow fell off from the wall, and the others jumped down upon him so that the hard floor would not hurt their feet. Of course, they took pains not to light on his head and get the pins in their feet. When all were safely down, they picked up the scarecrow, whose body was quite flattened out, and patted his straw into shape again. We must cross this strange place in order to get to the other side, said Dorothy, for it would be unwise for us to go any other way except due south. They began walking through the country of the China people, and the first thing they came to was a China milkmaid milking a China cow. As they drew near, the cow suddenly gave a kick and kicked over the stool, the pail, and even the milkmaid herself, all falling on the China ground with a great clatter. Dorothy was shocked to see that the cow had broken her leg short off and that the pail was lying in several small pieces while the poor milkmaid had a nick in her left elbow. There, cried the milkmaid angrily. See what you have done. My cow has broken her leg and I must take her to the mender's shop and have it glued on again. Why do you mean, what do you mean by coming here and frightening my cow? I'm very sorry, returned Dorothy. Please forgive us. But the pretty milkmaid was much too vexed to make any answer. She picked up the leg sulkily and led her cow away, the poor animal limping on three legs. As she left them, the milkmaid cast many reproachful glances over her shoulder at the clumsy strangers, holding her nicked elbow close to her side. Dorothy was quite grieved at this mishap. We must be very careful here, said the kind-hearted woodman, or we may hurt these pretty little people so they will never get over it. A little farther on, Dorothy met a most beautifully dressed young princess, who stopped short as she saw the strangers and started to run away. Dorothy wanted to see more of the princess, so she ran after her, but the china girl cried out, Don't chase me! Don't chase me! She had such a frightened little voice that Dorothy stopped and said, Why not? Because, answered the princess, also stopping a safe distance away, if I run, I may fall down and break myself. But couldn't you be mended? asked the girl. Oh yes, but one is never so pretty after being mended, you know, replied the princess. I suppose not, said Dorothy. Now, there is Mr. Joker, one of our clowns, continued the china lady, who was always trying to stand upon his head. He has broken himself so often that he is mended in a hundred places and doesn't look at all pretty. Here he comes now so you can see for yourself. Indeed, a jolly little clown came walking toward them and Dorothy could see that in spite of his pretty clothes of red and yellow and green, he was completely covered with cracks running every which way and showing plainly that he had been mended in many places. The clown put his hands in his pockets and after puffing out his cheeks and nodding his head at them saucily, he said, My lady fair, why do you stare at poor old Mr. Joker? You're quite as stiff and prim as if you'd eaten up a poker. Be quiet, sir, said the princess. Can't you see these are strangers and should be treated with respect? Well, that's respect, I expect, 
declared the clown and immediately stood upon his head. Don't mind Mr. Joker, said the princess to Dorothy. He is considerably cracked in his head and that makes him foolish. Oh, I don't mind him a bit, said Dorothy. But you are so beautiful, she continued, that I am sure I could love you dearly. Won't you let me carry you back to Kansas and stand you on Aunt Em's mantel shelf? I could carry you in my basket. That would make me very unhappy, answered the China princess. You see, here in our country we live contentedly and can talk and move around as we please. But whenever any of us are taken away, our joints at once stiffen and we can only stand straight and look pretty. Of course, that is all that is expected of us when we are on mantel shelves and cabinets and drawing room tables, but our lives are much pleasanter here in our own country. I would not make you unhappy for all the world, exclaimed Dorothy, so I'll just say goodbye. Goodbye, replied the princess. They walked carefully through the China country. The little animals and all the people scampered out of their way, fearing the strangers would break them. And after an hour or so, the travelers reached the other side of the country and came to another China wall. It was not as high as the first, however, and by standing upon the lion's back, they all managed to scramble to the top. Then the lion gathered his legs under him and jumped on the wall. But just as he jumped, he upset a china church with his tail and smashed it all to pieces. That was too bad, said Dorothy, but really I think we were lucky in not doing these little people more harm than breaking a cow's leg in a church. They are all so brittle. They are indeed, said the scarecrow. And I am thankful I am made of straw and cannot be easily damaged. There are worse things in the world than being a scarecrow. And that was chapter 20. So we will now go to chapter 21. And that is called The Lion Becomes the King of Beasts. And there's a lion. And it looks like a tiger with him. So let's find out. After climbing down from the China Wall, the travelers found themselves in a disagreeable country, full of bogs and marshes and covered with tall, rank grass. It was difficult to walk far without falling into muddy holes, for the grass was so thick that it hid them from sight. However, by carefully picking their way, they got safely along until they reached solid ground. But here, the country seemed wilder than ever and after a long and tiresome walk through the underbrush, they entered another forest where the trees were bigger and older than any they had ever seen. This forest is perfectly delightful, declared the lion, looking around him with joy. Never have I seen a more beautiful place. It seems gloomy, said the scarecrow. Not a bit of it answered the lion. I should like to live here all my life. See how soft the dried leaves are under your feet and how rich and green the mosses that clings to these old trees. Surely no wild beast could wish a pleasanter home. Perhaps there are wild beasts in the forest now, said Dorothy. I suppose there are, returned the lion, but I do not see any of them about. They walked through the forest until it became too dark to go any farther. Dorothy and Toto and the lion lay down to sleep, while the woodman and the scarecrow kept watch over them as usual. When morning came, they started again. Before they had gone far, they heard a low rumble, as of the growling of many wild animals. Toto whimpered a little, but none of the others was frightened, and they kept along the well-trodden path until they came to an opening in the wood in which were gathered hundreds of beasts of every variety. There were tigers and elephants and bears and wolves and foxes and all the others in the natural history. And for a moment, Dorothy was afraid. But the lion explained that the animals were holding a meeting and he judged by their snarling and growling that they were in great trouble. As he spoke, several of the beasts caught sight of him and at once the great assemblage hushed as if by magic. The biggest of the tigers came up to the lion and bowed, saying, Welcome, O king of beasts. You have come in good time to fight our enemy and bring peace to all the animals of the forest once more. What is your trouble? asked the lion quietly. 
We are all threatened, answered the tiger, by a fierce enemy which has lately come into this forest. It is a most tremendous monster, like a great spider, with a body as big as an elephant and legs as long as a tree trunk. It has eight of these long legs, and as the monster crawls through the forest, he seizes an animal with a leg and drags it to his mouth where he can eat it as a spider does a fly. Not one of us is safe while this fierce creature is alive, and we had called a meeting to decide how to take care of ourselves when you came among us. The lion thought for a moment. Are there any other lions in this forest? He asked. No, there were some, but the monster has eaten them all. And besides, they were none of them nearly so large and brave as you. If I put an end to your enemy, will you bow down to me and obey me as king of the forest? Inquired the lion. We will gladly do that returned the tiger and all the other beasts roared with a mighty roar we will where is this great spider of yours now asked the lion yonder among the oak trees said the tiger pointing with his poor forefoot take good care of these friends of mine said the lion and i will go at once to fight the monster he bade his comrades goodbye and marched proudly away to do battle with the enemy the great spider was lying asleep when the lion found him, and it looked so ugly that its foe turned up his nose in disgust. Its legs were quite as long as the tiger had said, and its body covered with coarse black hair. It had a great mouth with a row of sharp teeth a foot long, but its head was joined to the pudgy body by a neck as slender as a wasp's waist. This gave the lion a hint of the best way to attack the creature and as he knew it was easier to fight it asleep than awake. He gave a great spring and landed directly upon the monster's back. Then with one blow of his heavy paw, all armed with sharp claws, he knocked the spider's head from its body. Jumping down, he watched it until the long legs stopped wiggling when he knew it was quite dead. The lion went back to the opening where the beasts of the forest were waiting for him and said proudly, You need fear your enemy no longer. Then the beasts bowed down to the lion as their king, and he promised to come back and rule over them as soon as Dorothy was safely on her way to Kansas. There is a picture of the lion with one of the beasts. And that was the end of chapter 21. So tomorrow, we will find out what happens if they make it to see Glinda, if Dorothy ever makes it back to Kansas. We will have the exciting conclusion, chapters 22, 23, and 24. So I will see you tomorrow at seven o'clock. And if you want to leave any comments down below what you think will happen next, you can let me know on any thoughts on the story. And I will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye.